my talk will probably be a little different because I'm actually an engineer, um, a chemical engineer, and I thought I'd just tell you a little bit to start about how I got involved in, in the medical area. I got my degree in chemical engineering from MIT in 1974, and all my friends went into the oil industry uh, because they had very high paying jobs and, uh, and, and, and that's what chemical engineers did at that time. So I thought I'd do the same thing. So I applied to oil companies and I got uh, over 20 job offers, uh, four from Exxon alone. And I wasn't very good, but it didn't matter. They just had so many openings. But um, th the thing was, is that when I went to some of these uh, interviews, they said, if you could just increase the yield of uh, this one petrochemical by 0.1%, that would be worth billions of dollars. But when I flew, kept flying back to Boston, I kept thinking to myself, I didn't want to spend my whole life trying to increase the yield of something by such a tiny percentage. I thought that would be kind of boring. And I started to think, well, what, how could I use my chemical engineering education to help in other ways? When I was um, a, uh, a graduate student at MIT, uh, one of the things I did is I spent a lot of time uh, helping start a school for disadvantaged high school students. And one day I saw an ad uh, at one of the universities, City College of New York, to develop new chemistry curriculum, which is really one of the things I spent a lot of time doing at that high school. So I wrote them a letter applying for a job, but they didn't write me back. So I, um, but I liked that idea. So I found all the ads I could to do something like that, about 40, and I wrote to all those colleges and none of them wrote me back. So that wasn't going so well. So I started to think, what other way could I use my chemical engineering education to help people? And, and I thought about medicine. So I wrote to a lot of hospitals and medical schools. They, they didn't write me back either. But one day, I saw an, I, I, one of my, the people in the lab said to me, said, Bob, you, you should write this surgeon named Judah Folkman at Harvard. He said sometimes he hires unusual people. He thought very highly of Dr. Folkman. Dr. Folkman had this idea about how tumors grow. And what you see on this slide is they start out very small, but what really enables them to grow, he hypothesized, was their ability to get blood vessels. And he, because that would give them nutrition. And what, what he hypothesized was that they secreted a chemical substance, which he called tumor angiogenesis factor, or TAF. And, and, and that enabled them to grow. I, I, and, and what he wanted me to do uh, was to prove that he was right. It, it turned out that almost everybody uh, uh, in biology thought this was a, a crazy theory. Since I didn't know any biology, I thought it was really exciting. At any rate, I, uh, so my goal, he said, would be to prove he was right, but in so doing, isolate the very first blood vessel inhibitors. One of the biggest problems, though, is there was no way to study blood vessels very easily because almost every place you put things, there are background blood vessels. There are a couple places like the eye, the cornea, uh, maybe using a rabbit or the chick chorioleontoc membrane. And there are either very few or no blood vessels there. But if you put a tumor in, blood vessels will grow. So what we thought about is maybe what we could do is put the tumor in these and then have a tiny delivery system, like a nanoparticle or a microparticle. But we wanted it to be able to deliver large molecules. All of the molecules that we were isolating to study this were very large, like proteins or nucleic acids. And no one had ever de developed a, a delivery system that was tiny to, 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 to do this. And there was only one company in the world, a company called Alza, this is 1974, that even was working on of delivery systems. So he asked everyone there, uh, he was on their board, whether they could help. And they had Nobel Prize winners in chemistry and other very famous people on their board. They all said that it really wouldn't be possible to do this because the molecules were too big to get out of the, uh, of the little delivery systems. I mean, you could make it very porous, but of course then they're out right away. So basically the idea that they said is this couldn't really work any more than any of you or I could walk through a wall. But if we were going to solve the, if we were going to solve the blood vessel problem, we had to be able to solve the delivery problem. 
So I spent two years working in the laboratory and I found over 200 different ways to get this to not work. What I was able to do is make tiny little micro or nanoparticles. You see one on the left and cut in half on the right. What we were able to show is that you could use this approach um, to deliver really any large molecule. This was also the very first time that nucleic acids had been delivered uh, from little particles. This is a paper we wrote in Nature in 1976. I, I want to go back to three months before that paper came out. Um, I was asked, I was 27 years old. I was asked to give a talk at a scientific meeting. I'd never done this before uh, uh, with a lot of chemists and engineers. So I practiced it for weeks. Finally, I got up and I gave the talk and, and I thought I did all right. I didn't forget too much what I was going to say. And I thought when I was done with this talk that all these older scientists being nice people would want to encourage me, this young guy. But when I got done, I stepped off the podium and a whole bunch of them came up to me and they said, we don't believe anything you just said. They said what I mentioned before, that the molecules were too big. And they also said that the solvents I was using, like methylene chloride or ethanol, organic solvents, would destroy whatever we put in. And, and things went downhill from there, if that were possible. My first, I tried to get research grants. My first nine were rejected uh, very soundly because they said, uh, you know, I was an engineer and, you know, engineers, you know, couldn't do these things. Uh, then I tried to get a faculty position in chemical engineering, which is my discipline, but no chemical engineering department in the world would hire me. They said that chemical engineers should be doing energy or oil, but not biological. So finally, I did get a job in a nutrition department because uh, Dr. Folkman introduced me to Nevin Scrimshaw, who was head of that department. But Nevin was a, kind of what I'll call a benevolent dictator kind of department. He liked me, so he offered me a job, but he didn't ask anybody else in that department what they thought. That might have been okay, except for one thing, which was the year after I joined the department, he, he left. So a lot of the senior faculty told me uh, I should leave too. Uh, this is uh, Michael Marletta, a good friend of mine, um, who was at MIT at the time and later became head of Berkeley's chemistry department. I uh, was a member of the National Academy. And he was just describing uh, when I won an award a few years ago, what it was like to be with me at MIT in 1979. He said, well, one evening he went to a faculty dinner at a Chinese restaurant with me and some senior MIT professors. He said a senior scientist sat quizzing us while smoking a cigar. He said, when the older scientists heard my concepts for drug delivery, he blew a cloud of smoke in my face and said, you better start looking for another job. F fortunately, I'm still at MIT, but, uh, and, and also because we had developed the delivery systems, we could now try to solve the blood vessel problem. And what we did with Dr. Folkman and some of the surgeons was test over a hundred different fractions to see if we could find anything that could stop blood vessels. And almost every fraction didn't work. I, I think of those as the controls. We were able to find one fraction um, that, that did stop blood or at least slow them down. What you see on the left is a typical control where you see a sheet of blood vessels growing uh, to the tumor. But on the right, notice with, the, with this one fraction, it's not purified. Uh, the vessels are lower and sparser and avoid the tumor. We published this in Science in 1976. But as you probably all know, medicine doesn't move quickly, usually. So it took another 28 years and great work by Genentech and other companies, and billions of dollars. But starting in 2004, something remarkable happened 28 years later. What you see is that in 2004, Avastin gets approved by FDA. This is the number two or three best-selling biotech drug in history. And you see these continuing to be approved to this day. Five, actually, last year were approved. And not only are they approved for treating all kinds of cancer, but they are really the only medical treatments, uh, pharmacologic treatments, for treating diseases of blindness in the back of the eye, like macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy. Uh, Nature, the journal Nature, estimates that 500 million people will use these. Let me go back to 1970s uh, on the drug delivery part. 
So Dr. Volkman and I started talking, and we thought, well, maybe we should file a patent. That, that might seem common now, but in the 1970s, I had no patents, nor did Children's Hospital, which is a, a very good hospital. So we filed a patent, and five years in a row, it got rejected. Uh, and I remember the head of the hospital coming to see me one day and said, Bob, you should quit. They're never going to allow it, and you're wasting a lot of money. But, but I don't like to quit. So I started to think, how could we convince the examiner to allow the patent? Legally, of course. And um, science really wasn't working. But as I told you earlier, when we first started doing this, everyone said it was impossible. It couldn't work. I wondered, maybe someone wrote that down. So I did science citation search, looking at who cited our nature paper. It, uh, paper that paper was seven, a 76 paper. So I did this in 1982. And I found a lot of interesting papers. I think it's always interesting to see what people say about your work. Uh, and I had no idea in this case. But here is from a 1979 paper I found. And it, I'll just read you a section. It says, generally, the agent to be released is a relatively small molecule. One wouldn't expect that macromolecules could be released because of their extremely small permeation rates. However, Folkman and myself have reported some surprising results that clearly demonstrate the opposite. So I like that word surprising. So we showed it to the people at the hospital and they showed it to the patent examiner. And he said he had no idea, but he said, he tell you what, if I could get, Dr. Langer could get each of these five people to write uh, statements at what are called affidavits, that they really wrote this, he would allow the patent. So I wrote them and they were nice enough to write me back. They really wrote it. We got this really broad patent. With that patent, I got involved in uh, in teaching companies how to do this. I got involved in starting companies myself because a lot of them wouldn't try to use it. What you see are all kinds of products based on uh, what we did or from that patent um, that are used by hundreds of millions of people every year uh, to treat, like if you look in the middle, Lupron Depot, that's developed by Takeda, who we were working with. Uh, that's uh, and, and if you didn't have the delivery system, these wouldn't work because you their molecules are often too big to swallow. I mean, in the sense that they won't be absorbed, uh, and 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 uh, uh, or, or take any other way. And yet, if you inject them, the enzymes destroy them. But if you put them in tiny microspheres or implants, that doesn't happen. So Lupron Depot actually lasts for six months and is probably the most common way to treat advanced prostate cancer. And on the slide, there are all kinds of new ways, like Vivitrol to treat opioid addiction, um, uh, Risperdal to treat uh, schizophrenia. On the right, you see uh, uh, drug-eluting stents, which many people have for treating heart disease. And, and the, the, the technology is not limited just to medicine. It's actually widely used and helped permit this whole quarter of a trillion dollar industry on the bottom right uh, in aquaculture to give different uh, hormones to fish. At any rate, so we had done all this work and built on the Nature paper, and other people did too. But when we make mo what we found is that when molecules or when these particles were made really small, um, they would work, but there were issues. Like sometimes, because they're so small, the particles stick together like wet sand, and macrophages might also eat them. So myself, working with Vladimir Torchelin and others, uh, worked out ways to change that by adding polyethylene glycol. And we could make nanoparticles. The next slide shows that. And by atomic force microscopy, they are nanoparticles. And the next slide, by quasi-elastic light scattering, that they can be uh, nanoparticles. And what's exciting, if, where we put a little orange dye in these little particles, what you can see is after an hour, if you put them next to macrophages, without PEG, they're eaten right away. But with PEG, when you look at the other designs, they're, they're, you see very few orange dots in the cells. So, um, and maybe I'll just show you a quick video that the Nova, the TV show did, uh, based on our work, because they explain it much better than I do. Uh, next slide and video with sound. He starts with a nanoparticle of anti-cancer drug. That gets encased in a plastic that releases the drug over time. That, in turn, gets a special wrapping that disguises the package as a water molecule to fool the body's immune system. And last but not least, 
the address where it should be delivered, a key that will only fit the lock of cancer cells. I should tell you that the clinicians I work with tell me it doesn't really blow the cell up quite that way. But the nice thing about this is it would enable you to deliver not only small molecules, but even large molecules like sRNA or messenger RNA. And one of the things that we and others have done is incorporate uh, this kind of design uh, in nanoparticles. The most you could use different types, polymer or lipid, but lipid ones we've been working with for many, many years. And, and, uh, and, and, and we've selected to use those uh, to move forward in a lot of ways. Lipid nanoparticles have four components, mostly cholesterol, the peg lipid, based on what I said, a structural lipid, uh, and finally, what's called an ionizable cationic lipid. You use something cationic because it can condense the nucleic acids. But if you just make it purely cationic, it may cause complement activation and toxicity. So what we and uh, others have done, uh, we started doing this with Dan Pack, uh, who was a uh, one of Francis Arnold's uh, students and, and one of my postdoc in 2000, what we did is we'd make uh, the, uh, a, a fourth component, which is neutral uh, at, at body pH. But when it gets at, it, at uh, the, uh, in, into the cell, uh, it, the, the pH goes down and it becomes ionosable. And it will, that enables endosomal uh, escape. That's a, an article by Dan Pack from our group in 2000 and by uh, Peter Cullis's group in uh, that sample et al. in 2001. So when you use these, you could, uh, we thought, deliver uh, large molecules. And I'll just tell you one example of that. In 2010, myself and three others, Nubar Fayan, Ken Chen, and, and Derek Rossi, had the idea that we could make uh, messenger RNA therapeutics. I had been myself a consultant to Genentech for over 30 years, and I'd watched Genentech do wonderful work on, on protein therapies. But it seemed to me there you're using, you know, large cellular vats and takes a tremendous amount of time to do this. Or you might use eggs, for example, to make uh, vaccines, for example, for flu. But you have to start a year in advance, uh, and you have to guess what the vaccine should be, like H1N1, H1N2. A lot of times people guess wrong. But if you could use messenger RNA and protect it by putting it in a nanoparticle, that we thought could provide a whole new way of, of producing uh, proteins and vaccines. It might be able to do, uh, enable you to treat new diseases, like uh, making proteins that are intracellular or membrane bound. Also, Moderna, when we started it, was widely criticized by scientists. I mean, Nature wrote a very negative article on it. Um, and, and also, uh, stock analysts kept saying to short the stock and things like that, and the newspapers, too. But by the end of 2019, uh, we still had 13 products in early stage human clinical trials. And then COVID hit. And I thought I'd show you what uh, the Moderna scientists, many of whom are my students, were able to do. In January 11th, the Chinese scientists published the virus genetic sequence. It took two days, less than two days, for the Moderna scientists to design the vaccine. Maybe another month or so to put it in the nanoparticles, manufacture it, send it to NIH for testing. And the first patients were treated uh, really almost two months after it started. And uh, initially, when we first announced the data, again, people were very skeptical, says it didn't make sense. But before the end of the year, the, we had phase three data, which showed it was very effective. I'll show you some of that quickly in a second. And it's now been used all over the world. In fact, there's only two in the United States uh, up until recently that have been approved and 50 failures. Um, and the two that are approved are the that were approved are the Moderna vaccine, which is mRNA and nanoparticles and the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine, which uses different types of nanoparticles, but it's also uh, approved. And just to show you some of the data, uh, you see unvaccinated uh, compared to vaccinated with booster. Next slide shows effectiveness. This is from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, uh, and you can see it's 94% effective, which is quite unprecedented. Flu vaccine, for example, is about 40 to 50% effective. It's also quite safe. What you see 
by the way, I'm sure everyone knows, no vaccine is perfectly safe. But uh, here from published studies, you see the overall safety profile is a lower risk of adverse effects compared to flu vaccines. And the next slide shows that uh, that it's, it's not only, uh, this is over 6 million patients, uh, and it's extremely uh, effective and, and probably the safest vaccine out there. And, and just to end, I wanted to show you one other uh, treatment that's uh, in clinical trials now, uh, which is our personalized uh, cancer vaccines. So here you see 157 patients. This is a phase two trial with advanced melanoma. But you can do now what are called personalized cancer vaccines. These are in clinical trials. So that means you select up to 34 uh, mutations known as neoepitopes, and you put them, uh, you, you do this exactly the same way you do a COVID vaccine, messenger RNA and nanoparticles. And in this double-blind trial, half got Keytruda, that's Merck's uh, immunotherapy drug, it's a standard of care, and half get Keytruda plus the personalized cancer vaccine. And the re risk of recurrence or death was reduced by 44 uh, percent. This was, you know, fairly recently announced. And in fact, the uh, metastasis was reduced by 65 percent. So on the final slide, I was just going to show you that now, uh, in contrast to how uh, our work uh, was uh, viewed uh, almost 50 years ago, I got people start to look at this work as that really it did enable people to uh, this is from two nature papers or two nature reviews this year, the citing actually our paper 47 years ago that I mentioned in the beginning that people were very skeptical about, you know, that this now enables people to think about using DNA and RNA drug as a drug. And I hope this is just the beginning. I hope that there'll be all kinds of therapies. Uh, we ourselves are working with the Gates Foundation on, on many new, um, uh, in addition to Moderna, on many new uh, uh, approaches for uh, delivering uh, messenger RNA and other molecules. So I want to thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak, to congratulate you on, on this anniversary and this wonderful symposium. Thank you so much.